There is, however, a curious sequel to the matter of Orne and Hutchinson. If such indeed the exiled wizards were, moved by some vague presentiment amidst the horrors of that period, Willette arranged with an international press cutting bureau for accounts of the notable current crimes and accidents in Prague and in eastern Transylvania. And after six months, believed that he had found two very significant things among the multifarious items he had received and had translated. One was the total wrecking of a house by night in the oldest quarter of Prague and the disappearance of the evil old man called Joseph Nadeh, who had dwelt in it alone ever since anyone could remember. The other was a titan explosion in the Transylvanian mountains east of Rakus and the utter extirpation with all its inmates of the ill-regarded castle Ferenczi, whose master was so badly spoken of by peasants and soldiery alike that he would shortly have been summoned to Bucharest for serious questioning, had not this incident cut off a career already so long as to antedate all common memory. Well, it maintains that the hand which wrote these minuscules was able to wedge stronger weapons as well, and that while Kerman was left to him to dispose of, the writer felt able to find and deal with Orne and Hutchinson itself. Of what their fate may have been, the doctor strives sedulously not to think. Part 5 The following morning, Dr. Willette hastened to the ward home to be present when the detectives arrived. Alan's destruction, our imprisonment, our Kerwin's, if one might regard the tactic claim to reincarnation as valid. He felt must be accomplished at any cost, and he communicated this conviction to Mr. Ward as they sat waiting for the men to come. They were downstairs this time, for the upper parts of the house were beginning to be shunned because of a peculiar nauseousness, which hung indefinitely about a nauseousness which the older servants connected with some curse left by the vanished Kerwin portrait. At nine o'clock, three detectives presented themselves and immediately delivered all they had to say. They had not, regrettably enough, located the Bravatoni Gomes as they had wished, nor had they found the least trace of Dr. Allen's source or present whereabouts, but they had managed to unearth a considerable number of local impressions and facts concerning the reticent stranger. Allen had struck Pawtuxet people as a vaguely unnatural being, and there was a universal belief that his thickly sandy beard was either dyed or false. Well, if your beard's sandy, you better wash it. A belief conclusively upheld by the finding of such a false beard, together with a pair of dark glasses in his room, at the fateful bungalow. His voice, Mr. Ward, could hear testify from his one telephone conversation had a depth and hollowness that could not be forgotten, and his glance seemed to malign even through his smoked and horn-rimmed glasses. One shopkeeper in the course of negotiations had seen a specimen of his handwriting and declared it was very queer and crabbed, this being confirmed by the penciled notes of no clear meaning found in his room and identified by the merchant. In connection with the vampirism ructions of uh, the preceding summer, a majority of the gossips believed that Allen, rather than Ward, was the actual vampire. Statements were also obtained from the officials who had visited the bungalow after the unpleasant incident of the motor truck robbery. They felt less of the sinister in Dr. Allen, but had recognized him as the dominant figure in the queer shadowy cottage. The place had been too dark for them to observe him clearly, but they would know him again if they saw him. His beard had looked odd and thought that he had some slight scar above his dark spe spectacled right eye. As for the search of Alan's room, it yielded nothing definite save the beard and glasses, and several penciled notes and a crabbed writing. 
which Willette at once saw was identical with that shared by the old Corin manuscripts and by the voluminous recent notes of young Ward found in the vanished catacombs of horror. Dr. Willette and Mr. Ward caught something of a profound, subtle, and insidious cosmic fear from these data as they were gradually unfolded and almost trembled in following up the vague mad thought which had simultaneously reached their minds. The false beard and grass glasses, the crabbed Kerwin penmanship, the old portrait and its tiny scar, and the altered youth in the hospital with such a scar, that deep hollow voice on the telephone. Was it not of this that Mr. Ward was reminded when his son barked forth those pitiful tones to which he now claimed to be reduced? Who had ever seen Charles and Alan together? Yes, the officials had gone. Oh, yes, the officials had once, but who later on? Was it not when Alan left that Charles suddenly lost his growing fright and began to live wholly at the bungalow? Kerwin, Alan, Ward, in what blasphemous and abominable fusion had two ages and two persons become involved? That damnable resemblance of the picture to Charles had it not used to stare and stare and follow the boy around the room with its eyes. Why, too? that both Alan and Charles could copy Joseph Kerwin's handwriting, even when alone and off guard. And then the frightful work of those people, the lost crypt of horrors that had aged the doctor overnight, the starved monsters in the noisome pits, the awful formula which had yielded such nameless results, the message in many schools found in Willette's pocket, the papers and letters, and all the talk of graves and salts and discoveries, whether did anything, everything lead. And then Mr. Ward did the most sensible thing, steeling himself against any realization of why he did it. He gave the detectives an article to be shown to such Powtuxet shopkeepers as had seen the portentous Dr. Allen. That article was a photograph of his luckless son, on which he now carefully drew in ink the pair of heavy glasses and the black pointed beard, uh, the black pointed beard which the men had brought from Allen's room. Now. Some people are driven insane by their crimes, but, you know, we still should hold them accountable. I know of one particular individual committing A and B felonies, tasted the blood of one of their victims, at least, and then after that, things got a lot more crazy for this individual. Now, if they were locked up in an asylum for the rest of their life, um, that would be, you know, better than them in and out of jail. Because they certainly didn't get enough time for anything serious that they've done. For two hours, he waited with the doctor in the oppressive house where fear and miasma were slowly gathering as the empty panel in the upstairs library leered and leered and leered. Then... The men returned. Yes, the altered photograph was a very passable likeness of Dr. Allen. Mr. Ward turned pale, and Willette white, a suddenly dampened brow with his handkerchief. Allen, Ward, Kerwin. It was becoming too hideous for a coherent thought. What had the boy called out of the void? And what had it done to me? Uh, what had it done to him? What had really happened? From the first to last, who was that Alan who sought to kill Charles as too squeamish? And why has his, had his destined victim said in the postscript to that frantic letter that he must be so completely obliterated in acid? Why, too, had the minuscule message of whose origin no one dared to think so that Kerwin must be likewise obliterated? What was that change? And when had the final stage occurred? That day when his frantic note was received, he had been nervous all the morning, and then there was an alteration. He had slipped out unseen and swaggered boldly in past the men, hard to guard him. That was the time when he was out, but no. Had he not cried out in terror as he entered his study, this very room, what he had found there, or wait, what had found him, that simulacrum which brushed boldly in without having been seen to go, 
Was that an alien shadow? And a horror forcing itself upon a trembling figure which had never gone out at all? Had not the butler spoken of queer noises? Now, no demon's gonna make you do things. People can allow control to the point where they, oh no, it wasn't me, it was the demon. It's like, yeah. Willette rang for the man and asked him some low-toned questions. It had, surely enough, been a bad business. There had been noises, a cry, a gasp, a choking, and sort of a clattering, or creaking, or thumping, or all of these. And Mr. Charles was not the same when he stalked out. Without a word, the butler shivered as he spoke, and sniffed at the heavy air that blew down from some open window upstairs. Terror had settled definitely upon the house, and only the business-like detectives failed to imbibe a full measure of it. Even they were restless, for this case had held vague elements in the background, which pleased them not at all. Dr. Ouellette was thinking deeply and rapidly, and his thoughts were terrible ones. Now and then he would almost break into mutterings as he ran over in his head a new appalling and increasingly conclusive chain of nightmare happenings. Then Mr. Ward made a sign that the conference was over, and everyone save him and the doctor left the room. It was noon now, but shadows, as of coming night, seemed to engulf the phantom haunted mansion. Willette began talking very seriously to his host, and urged that he leave a great deal of the future investigation to him. There would be, he predicted, certain obnoxious elements which a friend could bear better than a relative. Well, a relative uh, would have that be more of a duty now, wouldn't they? As family physician, he must have a free hand, and the first thing he required was a period alone and undisturbed in the abandoned library upstairs, where the ancient overmantel had gathered about itself an aura of noisome horror and more intense than when Joseph Kerwin's features themselves glanced slyly down from the painted panel. Mr. Ward, dazed by the flood of grotesque morbidities and unthinkably maddening suggestions that poured in upon him from every side, could only acquiesce, and half an hour later the doctor was locked in the shunned room with the paneling from only court. The father, listening outside, heard fumbling sounds and moving and rummaging as the moments passed, and finally a wrench and a creak as if a tight cupboard were being opened. Then there was a muffled cry, a kind of snorting choke, and a hasty slamming of whatever had been opened. Almost at once, the key rattled, and Willette appeared in the hall, haggard and ghastly, and demanding wood for the real fireplace on the south wall of the room. The furnace was not enough, he said, and the electric log had little practical use. Longing, yet not daring, to ask questions, Mr. Ward gave the requisite orders, and the man brought some stout pine logs shuddering as he entered the tainted air of the library to place them in the grate. Willette, meanwhile, had gone up to the dismantled laboratory and brought down a few odds and ends not included in the moving of the July before. They were in a covered basket, and Mr. Ward never saw what they were. Then the doctor locked himself in the library once more, and by the clouds of smoke which rolled down past the window from the chimney, it was known that he had lighted the fire. Later, after a great rustling of newspapers, that odd wrench and creaking were heard again, followed by a thumping which none of the eavesdroppers liked. Thereafter, two suppressed cries of bullets were heard, and hard upon these came a switching rustle of indefinable hate, uh, hatefulness. Finally, the smoke that the wind beat down from the chimney grew very dark and acrid, and everything and everyone wished that the weather had been spared from this choking and venomous inundation of peculiar fumes. Mr. Ward's head reeled, and the servants all clustered together in a knot to watch the horrible black smoke swoop down. After an age of waiting, the vapors seemed to lighten, and half-formed sounds of scraping, sweeping, and other minor operations were heard behind the bolted door. And at last, after the slamming of some cupboard within, Willett made his appearance, sad, pale, and haggard, and bearing the cloth-draped basket, he had taken from the upstairs laboratory. He had left the window open, and into that once accursed room, with a pouring wealth of pure 
wholesome air to mix in with a queer new smell of disinfectants. The ancient overmantle still lingered, but it seemed robbed of malignity now. As rose, as calm, and rose as calm and stately in its white paneling as if it had never borne the picture of Joseph Kerwin, night was coming on, yet this time the shadows held no latent fright, but only a gentle melancholy of what he had done the doctor would never speak. To Mr. Ward, he'd said, I can answer no questions, but I will say that there are different kinds of magic, and I have made a great projection. Those in the house will sleep the better for it. Part 6. That Dr. Ouellette's purgation had been an ordeal almost as nerve-wracking in its way as his hideous wandering in the vanished crypt is shown by the fact that the elderly physician gave out completely as soon as he reached home that evening. For three days he rested constantly in his room, though servants later muttered something about having heard him after midnight on Wednesday, when the outer door softly opened and closed with phenomenal softness. Servants' imaginations, fortunately, are limited. <coughs> are perhaps better than the people who pay them. Else comment might have been excited by an item in Thursday's evening bulletin, which ran as follows. Wake up screaming. North End Ghouls again active. I, I read the title again. Um, after a lull of ten months since the dastardly vandalism in the Whedon lot at the North Burial Ground, a nocturnal prowler was glimpsed early this morning in the same cemetery by Robert Hall, the night watchman. Having to glance for a moment from a shelter about 2 a.m., Hart observed a glow of a lantern or a pocket torch not far from the northward, and upon the opening of the door detected the figure of a man with the trowel very plainly silhouetted against a nearby electric light. At once starting in pursuit, he saw the figure dart hurriedly toward the main entrance, gaining the street and losing himself among the shadows. Before approach or capture was possible. Like the first of the ghouls active during the past year, this intruder had done no real damage before detection. A vacant part of the ward blot showed signs of a little superficial digging, but nothing even nearly the size of a grave had been attempted, and no previous grave had been disturbed. Hart, who cannot describe the prowler except as a small man probably having a full beard, inclines to the view that all three of the digging incidents have a common source, but police from the second station think otherwise on account of the savage nature of the second incident, where an ancient coffin was removed and its headstone violently scattered, uh, shattered. <clears throat>